As CEO, Martin Hertzberger has scaled two companies to eight figures. As a small business owner, he sold to Apple, HP, and American Express, to name a few. He has spent the last 16 years consulting to $5 million to $50 million businesses. Today, Martin is helping business owners and CEOs prepare for a successful transition by developing and executing a strategy that provides the basis for repeatable and profitable growth. Most, uh, change in, most change initiatives fail because they offer partial solutions. Martin has developed a framework to ensure all functions of the organization are in sync and in position to support the strategy. Martin, welcome to the DealQuest podcast. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's great to have you. I mean, I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting into this conversation because, you know, this, these, these repeatable, uh, you know, processes, uh, you know, people underestimate sometimes how much more enterprise value you can build when you have systems and processes and repeatable income. And, you know, I recently had Joel Block on an episode where he um, does this trend report. And one of the things he's talk, talked about is the move to, to a subscription, which is just a form of repeatable income, right? And, and right. obviously... With a subscription, you need to have a model, and that's uh, yeah, and processes that are repeatable as well, and companies uh, that have that recurring revenue are certainly worth more. So I'm looking forward to digging into all that and what you do now with uh, consulting to uh, uh, entrepreneurs and, and, and growing companies. But before we do all that, I want to take you back to when you were growing up as a little kid, maybe eight, 10, 12 years old. Uh, what did you want to be? Because my guess is uh, consulting to uh, Growing companies about their processes and systems was likely not it, but you tell me. I want to be a ball player like everybody else. <laughs> I played a lot of baseball, but that was it. That's what I wanted to be. But things don't work out, right? And what and uh, and and what team were you? Did you imagine yourself playing for? Well, I was. I was always a Red Sox fan. I grew up in Pittsburgh, but I was always a Red Sox fan. So wow. I guess oh. my dad was a Ted Williams fan, so that kind of rubbed off on me. Oh, got it. Interesting. Interesting. So you must have you must have taken some uh, guff from your uh, Pittsburgh friends, uh, Vina. Not too much. You know, like... Your team over there. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So um, I, I know we talked about it in your bio a little bit, but but just give us you know give us uh, thirty seconds or a minute in terms of you know the kind of clients you work with and what you're doing now, and then I want to jump into uh, the deal related conversation. Okay. Uh, primarily uh, industrial service and manufacturing and supply chain. Yep. Uh, to me, the supply chain and manufacturing is synonymous. Uh, you have to learn to work with the suppliers and suppliers have to work with you to create value in the chain. So uh, I kind of focus on that. Yeah, great. And, and, uh, and that's, you know, so um, we mentioned some of the companies, uh, you know, that you've worked with. So, uh, you know, you what, I'm just uh, in terms of your journey, actually, before we even get to deals, I'm curious as to um, what had you make that transition from working in corporate, you know, to uh, being a consultant? Well, two things. Um, one is I was at a mainframe computer company. And when I went to headquarters, uh, I don't remember what year it was now, but we had about 66,000 employees. We're a $4 billion company. And you know what happened to mainframes. So when I left, there was still, I don't know, we were about $2 million, billion company. We were about cut in half. My years as an executive there was pretty much downsizing and meeting numbers, you know, right. so it wasn't, it wasn't fun. But one of the things I did for them, I did some turnaround stuff. So that's one reason I moved every couple of years. And the last thing I did was a logistics problem. They had uh, a national or global, actually. But I solved it with consolidating parts in Memphis with FedEx and, and, and did some stuff with that. And I thought, everybody's got this problem. So we, we put together a, a business plan, a partner and I, uh, who was with the company as well, and uh, went out and raised funding. And sure enough, we, we launched it. Great. All right. So you, you mentioned in that at least two types of deals. One is a business, business partnership deal. You had a partner and two is you raised some capital. So uh, talk to me a little bit. Obviously, you don't have to reveal anything confidential, but, you know, in terms of sort of anything about uh, how those deals came down, what you learned, you know, lessons from uh, from uh, being in a business partnership and from raising capital. Well, I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, I was so naive raising capital. I couldn't have picked worse partners. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a true statement. Uh, I, I had a, a private group out of Florida and a medical group out of Memphis. Um, they put in a uh, less than a million dollars in cash and then primarily guaranteed debt. So my balance sheet, I never I always had negative net equity. Yes. So I'm selling to American Express and Apple and Compaq with a negative balance sheet. So I had... <laughs> 
<laughs> I had a lot of convincing to do when I, I had to sit down with their senior management and say, okay, here's, what's, here's what we look like. So it was, a, it was an issue. Uh, the other thing, we, we agreed on the front end where they gave me a lecture. They say, uh, founders always get attached to the business. We want to cash out in five years. And I was fine with that. That was my strategy, five to 10 years. Yes. Well, we had five offers to, to buy the business and they wouldn't accept any of them because wow. we had, yeah, it was totally backwards on me. We had, we had some pretty good years and, and my concern was a lot of my, my revenue was, um, was uh, repair refer based. Uh, for example, I did, uh, I handled all the returns for Apple North America and we repackaged, refurbed it and uh, sold it as used, that kind of thing. Uh, and knowing that the cost of electronics falls, having just come out of the mainframe business, I knew that we had a, um, a narrow window, right? And we had some great offers, but they wouldn't take it. So how did that work out? Not, not so well. I did okay because I cashed out. They wanted to go in to do a dot com to actually buy inventory from manufacturers that they couldn't sell and try to sell it on the internet, which was, it, was, it just wasn't a good idea. Wow. Manufacturers didn't want on inventory. Why would we want on it? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they just did, they, they thought the business was worth more than the office uh, yeah. that you got at yeah. that time? Yeah. I, I mean, uh, four, four, uh, four or five years in, we had a $20 million offer. And their answer was, uh, it'll be worth $100 million in five years. So they wouldn't, they, we couldn't uh, satisfy it. You know, so so I, how did that deal turn out? I mean, I'm a lot wiser now. <laughs> we still had something in writing about what our our expectations were the return on their investment was phenomenal if they had just yeah. taken it but they wouldn't take yeah. it so and, and they lived to, to regret it it sounds like yeah they did they uh and i knew they were going to because you know my 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 contact with computer I'll give you an example walking through a warehouse one day with an apple vp i, I had to add seventy five thousand feet to my warehouse i had a five hundred thousand foot warehouse just for apple and he's he, he made a comment. He said, what do you see on the shelves? I said, computers. He said, no, I see bananas. They spoiled 7% a month. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wanted to own it. So they were actually buying it for them from them and trying to sell on the internet because they got into this, I was right at the end of the dot-com bubble and they thought they could put dot-com at the end of the name, they'd all get rich. But uh, work out that way. Well, yeah, I, and I guess, uh, I mean, listen, I remember those days and there were some stupid valuations going on for crazy yeah, things back then. Wonder, so, yeah. <laughs> until, until, of course, it all, you know, <laughs> it all bur burst. But uh, yeah, so they had an inflated view. You know, it's interesting. I, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've been practicing law for 36, 35 years plus now. And, um, you know, I remember those times and I had some clients that, you know, made stupid money and got out when that, like, I, I have a good friend of mine who's been a client of mine for many, many years now with three businesses. And I remember his business then, he made a ridiculous amount of money, never had a profit. And the business that he's run since is highly profitable and will never, you know, sell for those multiples. Yeah, you know? no, that's right. It was, it was, uh, it was enough to underpinning those multiples for sure. And that's what, that's what got these guys. They saw what was happening and they said, well, we've got a track record. We're going to, and it just didn't work. And I, I saw that and got, got out. My oh, partner so got out after a year in. He had some medical issues. So I was oh, okay. about uh, nine years uh, without him, but uh, he did okay as well. Good, good. Um, and any any lessons? Got, had you been in business partnerships before, or was this your first business partnership? Or? That was the first one. Um, you know, other than working with, I, I worked with this guy for uh, seven or eight years, so I knew him pretty well. We had uh, complementary skills. He was more administrative and and uh, IT, which we our, our value proposition was IT, so it was a great fit. And I was more uh, operational and, and sales, so we yeah. it was a good fit for us. Makes sense. So so it sounds like that was a good partnership. Obviously, he had some some issues and how to get out, but that was unrelated to the to the partnership. But it sounds like it was a you know. So any any uh, any lessons, positive and negatives, uh, you know, particularly out of in terms of business partnerships that you had uh, that experience or any other. Experience? I know you're no no. We we had an understanding between us of what we wanted. We both stuck to that, but but, yes. but didn't you know we had a uh, an agreement with them relative to financing. But we had a we had a verbal understanding, but not a written. We should have looking back if we had documented that with all been a, right, right with with with, uh, with your VCs, but uh, but but with your partner it was it was good. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um. All right. And uh, any other before we get into because I do want to get into the to the meat of what we're going to be talking to, uh, today about, which is sort of what you do that actually helps 
you know, companies position themselves to sell. And even if they don't sell, it puts them in a better position as well. But any other past, uh, you know, experience with any, you know, other types of deals that sort of have informed, you know, what you do for clients now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, one of the last things I did for, uh, for uh, the company I was with is I shut down, I was one of the team of three to shut down their supercomputer division. And I negotiated settlements with 300 vendors. So that, wow. <laughs> I learned a lot about negotiation there. But when I got my own company, uh, we had some really rapid growth, uh, which is good and bad. <laughs> right. I'm trying to keep up with it. But um, what did it was the partnerships or strategic partnerships we had with, with marquee name companies. Yes. You know, the first company we signed was Amex. Uh, we took care of all the credit card terminals uh, worldwide, I guess. I don't know. Um, they were a tough customer in the logistics industry. Uh, they had some particular requirements, and we met those. And, and once we had that, and then the Apple and some of the others that followed on, um, we traded on their name rather than mine. Sure. Which was, uh, which was a lot better. So, so getting that first strategic partner, you know, or alliance or, you know, uh, is always the toughest one, right? Especially at that level, yeah. those kind of names. Um, so, um, you know, how did you, how, did you have a relationship there? You know, how'd you get in there? How'd, how'd you land the first one? We had a, what, what we did, uh, FedEx had a logistics organization at the time that competed with us, believe it or not. And we came into town, but we had the technical skills and, the, and we had an IT system that we could tie into FedEx's system. So from the time I, I took a part off the shelf in a warehouse, I would print two air bills, one to ship it out and one to track it coming back. My system would track it and, and then look out and after three days, I didn't see the air bill in the FedEx system. We'd call a we customer service call and say, look, send it back or you bought it type thing. Because right. we were what we were selling was pipeline management. And by getting it back and get and referring it and get it on the shelf, we were able to reduce our inventory significantly. Wow. Uh, like for Amex, I think it was something like 60%. We were over the years, over 10 years, we were able to reach inventory by that much. We do a complete work uh, refurb on it and put it back on the shelf. So they were looking at seven to 10 days versus two to three months doing it internally. So what we had was that everybody wanted to do, do, to do it. They looked at the system. We had some demos and that kind of thing. But they were scared to death of us because we were new in our balance sheet. So somebody had right. to be first. Uh, so the first one was the toughest. Once the first one got in, it got a little bit easier. And, 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 and how did you land that first one? What, was it just great, great sales? Was it connections? Was it, you know? Yeah, I mean, it was just straight sales. Like we we had we made many trips to Phoenix and yeah. then into into us. They liked the system. Uh, they talked to the investors. Uh, had to get them together to say, yeah, they're gonna they're gonna back us. That kind of thing. Um, and the other thing was, to be honest, I sent them to FedEx to see what the what they could do, and I knew they couldn't do what we were doing. So even though I was one of FedEx's biggest shippers at the time. Um, I was really a competitor with the logistics side. So, but I did send, I usually send people there. When they, when they coming into Memphis, I'd say, are you going to FedEx too? And they say, yeah. I said, well, go there first. <laughs> 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 so they come back in. So we, we, we relied pretty much, we had a good value proposition. I understood the problem very well from, from the big company that I worked for. I understood how it worked out in this bigger industries. And, and I understood how I could shrink that pipeline. So yeah. I pushed back on that. I'll tell you, I don't think there are many people who can say that uh, to actually land a big client as a competitive advantage, they actually send people to FedEx. Like, you know, that you, like, I don't know how many people can say that, uh, Martin. <laughs> you, know, you may be the only one that I know well, of. I knew it was there. I wouldn't do it today. I'm sure they, uh, they're they well advanced today than where we were at the time. But at the time, they were really, they, they, they tried to trade on the name of the overnight freight, which is awesome to be, no question about it, which is why we used them. But their logistics was really just storage. They weren't adding any value with the with the turns or anything like that. So I knew that, and I thought I'm going to compare it. So it was a, it was a selling point for us. Love it, love it. Okay, so so now you know you've t you've taken all this experience that you had at, at these uh, you know big companies, um, you know helping them grow, uh, dealing with uh, downsizing and you know negotiating and all these things, and now uh, you know you, you start your own consulting. Uh, firm and you work with companies to help them, you know, systemize, et cetera. So talk, talk to us a little bit more about, about what you do and also just how that, um, you know, benefits the company. And and for me, I mean, and this is not, you know, anybody who does this understands that uh, the things you do that create systems and create things to be repeatable and recurring income and all that kind of stuff 
helps you in, in terms of current cash flow and profit and also, you know, helps the value of the company. So it's even if you never sell, like it makes sense no matter what you, your, your plan is, but it certainly helps on the back end as well. Well, I, when I tell people, the company always has to be ready to sell whether you want to sell it or not, because it gives you options of financing and, and a lot of other things. So, I mean, uh, um, I had a client uh, a few years back that, that, that used to ride cycles. He was a government contractor. So when he was, when he got the contract five years, he was fat and then he would, he would cycle through it. And he said, he made a comment. I'll never forget it. He said, you know, I don't want to sell my company. Nobody wants to buy it. <laughs> because he's trying to sell in a downturn. I said, no, your value is, is somewhere else, right? Um, so what I start, if I go in uh, and, and talk and look at companies, and I've looked at a lot of them over my years, number one, most people don't have a, uh, a transition plan in their mind. Uh, yes. They might have a vague idea that someday they want to go fishing in Florida or something. That, that, so they don't prepare themselves or their company for them to transition. Yes. Uh, by that, I mean the business, typically the founder of the business resides on, on your ability. So somebody comes in and I've done this M&As, come in and talk to someone and I look at the business and I say, the business is you. <laughs> so if I buy it, you've got to stay here and, and right. work for me. And which is, you know, they don't want to hear that, but it's, it's the truth. And, and part of that is, is they don't do a holistic look at the business itself. When, when you're emotionally attached to a business, you don't see things that, Somebody like me can see, I walk in and say, God, why are you doing this? You know, and, and there's usually an, an answer, but it's not necessarily a good one. But what, what I do is, is, is try to address the fact, like I, I call it repeatable business development. What it is is strategic planning. <laughs> but people don't like strategic planning. Why? Because it, they don't execute. So right. what I talk about is, is, do you want to have more predictability in your business? Do you want to have it repeatable? That kind of thing. And we take a, we take a hard, hard look at where they are or hard look where they want to go first. I start with that and I start with the CEO. Yeah. And where do you want to be in 10 years personally? And, and he, you know, sometimes he knows, sometimes a lot of times he doesn't. And we'll talk through that. And I'll say, okay, let, what's a, what does the business have to deliver to you in the event of a transition for you to realize that lifestyle? And then we go through that. I said, well, look where you're at. It's not going to do that. <laughs> you know, if you're running on a million dollar EBITDA right now, you've got a million dollars cash. But if you're running a million dollar EBITDA five times after after taxes and, and cost of the deal, you're looking at $2 million. You invest that today, what are you getting? 100 grand or 120 grand a month or a year. So right. it's a big shift. So I try to make them understand that. So okay, oh, how, how do we build that value? So then we look at where they are now at, 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 at every aspect of the business. And we put together a strategy that says, okay, here's your weaknesses, here's your strengths. And it's, it's not rocket science, it's block of tackling. Yep. People don't do it. If people have a sales problem, they'll bring in some marketing or sales guy and say, okay, I've got to tackle my sales. And the question I ask them is, why sell more if you're not making any money on what you're selling right now? Because <laughs> you've got waste in the process, that kind of thing. So, I mean, it, it's, it's just, a, it, it's, it's just a, a deep dive on the business. And what I do differently, I guess, than most is I, I do a retainer based thing where I, I become an accountability coach. It says once a month, we sit down and say, look, guys, you told me when to do this. Right. Where are we now? What, what's, the, what are the obstacles? What can we do to, to take, to keep it in front of it? And I, I found some success with that. So, so what are the characteristics of, because I'm, I'm sure no matter how, you know, great you are at what you do, you have some folks that don't aren't successful because not because uh, you've given them bad advice or whatever, but because they haven't taken action or followed your advice or, you know, whatever. And, and then you have them show plenty of that too. What, what do you see the main difference between the folks that are able to implement and, and, you know, and take your advice versus the ones that, you know, I assume, you know, a small percentage. But, it, it or something like and, and, you know, where I, I've made a, a pact with myself. Now I don't deal with family businesses. And the reason I don't deal with family businesses is don't hire somebody you can't fire who's not carrying their weight. <laughs> so, because I've run into that, you know, yes. where I can look at it and say, you know, half the staff is expendable and you don't make any money, but we can't get rid of it. So uh, the other is I try to personalize it. Say, look, this is what you wanted. This is what you, you've earned over your, your period of time. This is, this is where you want to be. And to do that, you're going to have to take certain steps. And if you don't want to do it, I can't force you, but I keep reminding them that this is their right. goal, not mine. Right. right. Yeah. And that makes a big difference. And it's, it, you know, it's amazing to me. Well, first of all, as a little uh, on your family business comment, 
I've had a couple of episodes in the last, I don't know, probably 20 episodes on folks that actually focus on in family business. And I am always, um, you know, unbelievably impressed and also at the same time, just uh, feel bad in some ways for these folks because it's, that's a tough, that is a tough road. And, you know, and, and, um, you know, I've got, uh, you know, uh, Lori Bachman on, then I had uh, um, a couple of folks, a couple of these amazing sisters who were on, uh, who uh, do it a lot in, in, in the Europe, in Europe and the Middle East. And, uh, and, uh, and they, they have a lot of reasons. So in any case, but when I, uh, so if folks can look back over the last, they want to see, uh, you know, about that. And there are these unique, you know, things, you know, right in there. And one of the things that they did talk about is the fact that not every family member is meant to work in the business, right? You know, exactly. uh, I mean, they may, they may inherit an ownership, um, you know, piece and, 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 and there, there's, things about learning how to be a good owner, even if you're not in the business and, you know, and, and all those dynamics, but any case. So, yes. So let's take that over the table for a moment. Um, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, you know, this sort of, you know, dichotomy of, of people who, you know, take that action or whatever, I, you know, it's so important because I see folks, you know, folks come to me sometimes and they haven't done any of that work. Right. And, and they want to get X, you know, for their company. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a valuation guy, but in, in some of the industries I work in, I know the multiples, I know, you know, generally what, you know, and I can, I, I, I can read a financial statement and, you know, I, I can look sometimes and say, you're not going to get that, or they, they go out and get a valuation or they just, you know, have the company on the market and they're getting, you know, offers at, you know, half or, you know, 60% or whatever of, of, of what they want. And, you know, and listen, ultimately, the market's going to tell you what your company's worth, right? Um, and, you know, and then they get insulted because, you know, some of them are like, well, you know, I have 30, 25 years into this business. Well, that doesn't, the buyer doesn't care whether you have 20. I mean, the, the only thing that gives you possibly is some history and name recognition, which gives some value. But the, the amount of hours you worked and how long it took you to build it are, you know, not highly relevant yeah. <laughs> to the buyer's valuation. You, you, you anyway. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I, I see people who, you know, and then, you know, a lot of times you know, they get a rude awakening, then they got to pull the company off the market, then they got to spend three years, you know, uh, plus in, in, in doing what they should have done in the first place, right? Right. I, I tell you should be planning three to five years before you transition. You got to show the historicals, you got to show the fact that you're expendable. There's a lot of work goes into that. And, and how often do you see that? But not very often. Right. So, so to, talk to me about some of the elements, right? You know, you know, obviously, you know, I'm sure it involves team, it involves systems, it involves mindset shifts, you know, so you, 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 know, you tell me, because, you know, you talk about what, one of the things that distinguishes you is that you are not just looking at one aspect of it, right? You're looking at it holistically. So what are the various buckets, you know, that companies need to look at to get well, it right? Well, uh, several common things I look at, okay? Uh, <clears throat> lack of process or, or you know, they have process and not being followed because processes aren't solid and everybody's going around it. Uh, lack of KPIs, you know, they're managing off the p and so it's, 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 they're slow to react. So they're constantly putting out fires. Communications is a huge issue everywhere I go. Communications and leadership. Um, how often CEOs that founded a company go down the factory store and talk to people? You know, myself, when I started my company, I had eight employees. So when, I finished, I had 550 in Memphis and 120 in Europe. I didn't right. everybody, but I did make it a point to go talk to them, you know, because I want to, I want them to know I'm there and I want to know what they're thinking. Uh, just the biggest thing I see is, is the employees today uh, are a little different than old guys like me. I mean, we, we were expected to go to work and, and not be necessarily happy to do your job. Uh, that's not the same today. You know, when people want to know what their expectations are and they want to know that the expectations aren't changing. And if you're not a strategy, and I've seen this a lot, is, is the expectations change by day. Yeah. You know, so it frustrates them and the turnover goes up and that kind of thing. So it all gets back down to me to having a vision, strategy, some core values. And I know that sounds old fashioned, but that's what's missing. Yeah. 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 And you're right. And listen, I, you know, there, there are many people who I know speak specifically on the difference of managing different generations of, you know, of folks or whatever. And, and of course that could be a little, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's people make blanket statements that aren't necessarily true, but having said that there are sort of different, you know, like the, the joke I, you know, I, I think about is, you know, 
nowadays a lot of uh, folks value additional time off, right, as a perk, right? And um, and you know, I think back to my grandfather, uh, and it's probably true in my day too. But I specifically think about my grandfather because he's my grandfather is a guy that was a sanitation worker, right? Uh, in his day, they called him a garbage man. Um, for for twenty years, he retired out of the city, and then he went to work five IBM in a call center. And like for him, being in an office, like and having an office job, was like you know huge. And he put in like another twenty there and, and retired with the gold watch, right? And um, you know, and for him, if somebody said to him, "Oh, Albert, you did a great job. I'm going to give you some additional time off," he would look at them like like they were nuts. Yeah. Like yeah. like, are you trying to fire me? Like did I do something wrong? Like you know like. Like that would not be seen as a perk. That would worry him. Like, you know, you wouldn't yeah. even, you know, consider. Well, I grew up in a coal mining town, okay? I mean, my granddad worked in the mines and the mines was less than a quarter mile off my house. And he'd come home from work at night and he by five o'clock, he'd tell me to ride my bike over the mine to see if the light was red or green. <laughs> because if the light was red, he didn't work the next day. If the light was green, he worked. Right. And, you know, I remember that. I mean, it, it, going to work was important, you know? Yeah. So my mindset i grew up with that and now you're right people want people want a, a life a more balanced life probably than than i had or you had you know because we're not maybe not as bright as they were not, but um the thing about that is too with social media if you've got a bad reputation of your employees everybody knows it that's what gets back to core values core values used to be kind of a soft thing you know or integrity whatever but you better have that today because you can't yeah. attack attract and retain people and and you gotta you gotta live that and that's some it's something it took me a while to learn dealing with companies i'm saying that that's a problem it's a leadership thing because they don't you know they'll treat people differently well you can't do that today <laughs> you know in the old days okay as long as he's not on my back today i'm fine <laughs> 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 but that's not the way it works today because it gets out so yeah. it, 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 it's really funny because they talk about technology and they talk about automation and the problems I see are really blocking and tackling. Yeah. You're not making the most of what you have. I just wrote an article for something um, about big companies, manufacturing companies can afford to automate, which they can. I just watched a video of a BMW factory in Germany. It was really awesome, but you have no people in, it, in the paint shop. I mean, it was crazy. Right. But a smaller company can't do that. So to reduce cost, what can they do? They can manage their processes. They can look at their their cost and they can manage them as close as they can. And to do that, you got to have KPIs, you got to have some kind of measurement in place. You got to watch it. Uh, automation isn't, uh, most of the manufacturers I deal with, they can't automate that much. Yeah, yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And it's, uh, yeah, and, and listen, you know, it's funny because in in any, you know, business coaches, business growth courses, any, you know, any reading, whatever, I mean, having, having KPIs, having those key performance indicators that are, and also, you know, one of the mistakes that companies make is they only look at lagging, right? That not leading, you know, indicators, right? So yeah, they only find out, they only find out about stuff. Like e e even if they're getting proper reporting, which on the lagging indicators, which is not always <laughs> the case, right? <laughs> even if they are getting proper reporting on the la lagging indicators, but time, by the time they see it, it's, you know, they're in trouble. And, you know, they, it's not too late, they're going to dig themselves out. Get down, you're right. I mean, there's no, no, no trending, no nothing. And, and it's, the reason I bring it out, it's not like it's one company. It's 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 a lot. Yeah. It's the vast majority, at least the ones I've seen. Yeah. Uh, it's strictly off PL. PL is maybe six weeks after the problem happens. Right. What do right. you do with it? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So it's uh so it's interesting. And then um, so I was, you know, you said you start with the CEO, which makes sense. And then I'm assuming you move to the leadership team, you know, oh, yeah. uh, from there. That's the way it works, yeah. Yeah. And part of that is I'll, I learn a lot there because I'll watch if they defer to the CEO, you know, when we start talking about strengths and weaknesses, and I'll, I'll see if there's agreement or any pushback. And, and if there isn't, then my job is to get, get the dialogue going because yeah. you don't want a one man plan, yeah. a one lady plan, whatever it is, a one person plan. You want buy in, you want, you want uh, cross pollination of the planning. And, you know, I'll watch that. If it's not happening, I'll get it out. Yeah. And, you know, and it's interesting how that comes back up to the CEO, right? Because he, you know, he or she is the one who created that culture is either open and encourages, you know, people or, or wants a lot of yes people around them. And, and that's, you know, and that's that, you know, that's the biggest mistake. I mean, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, <laughs> people are sometimes like, I, I'll, uh, uh, I've been driving, you know, let's say in my car with the, you know, 
business colleague of mine, or like you know, somebody, a friend of mine owns another company, and he'll sometimes hear my people, you know, if I'm calling with them, like, like really pushing back, you know, on me, and um, and I'm like that's the way I want it. Like I want, I don't care what, I don't care who it is, I don't care if it's my assistant, my sec, you know, reception, whatever, you know, if they see something and and they you know, listen, ultimately, obviously, you know, the buck stops here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna make a decision, and if I disagree with them, I'll, you know, I'll, I'm gonna take it into account, I'm gonna also explain it to them, appreciate them, whatever, but much more often, you know, if they're feeling strongly about something, it's you know, it, it's there's something for me to look at, you know. Exactly. I mean, I I, I don't see everything when I was with the company I had. I mean, I, I wanted input. If I wasn't getting it, I was frustrated. I used to say, if I got to do your job, I'll take your paycheck back. I'm telling <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> so, so. so so I know, you know, obviously, you know, you work in, in different industries, although it's, you know, a lot in, in uh, manufacturing, logistics, that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, do you have a feel, uh on um, like the difference in magnitude of value that companies get, uh, you know, that, that that figure this out that do it really well versus the companies that that don't do well in terms of you know processes and systemizing and become and having them be less dependent upon the founder, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah I I think I do by by industry. I mean, it varies by industry. Sure. You know, but uh, a lot of it is is depends on repeatability and whether I need you or not. If I can bring in a manager and, and see the same results, that's that creates value. Yeah. Because right? I know, unless you have an earnout, I know once we own the business, your hair's not in it anymore, right? So right. the, the earnout has to, is critical. Uh, so then you're going to cut corners to get the earnout. So I mean, that's it's not an ideal situation for your side. Yeah, and have you? I mean, uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen stats or or just uh, experiences in some of the industries you're in on. You know, because I mean, for me in the areas that I'm in, well, first of all, it could be the difference between being able to sell the company and not. Let's yeah. start there, like doing, being able to do it any deal and not doing a deal. But then, you know, I, I mean, I've seen differences of sometimes, you know, two, three, four, five times, you know, like the value, you know, I mean, right. more, you know, like, you know, like it, you're not talking about a, a 10 or 20% valuation difference. You're talking about multiples often. Absolutely. Uh, there was a book written a while back with, uh, I think his name was David Thompson, uh, Blueprint to a Billion. I don't know if you ever read that. I haven't. Um, he did a study on companies' valuations. So everybody that went public since 1984. And and he, how many, I can't remember the exact numbers, and I apologize because I used to use it a lot. But yeah. How many reached a billion dollars? Yeah. yeah. He, there were seven steps that each company that had at least five of those seven steps that hit a billion dollars. And it was only like a hundred and something. I mean, it was, wasn't a lot. Yeah. Um, but it talked about being able to attract marquee customers, yeah. having a strong value proposition, yeah. eatability. I mean, all the things we're talking about. So the, da- yeah. the data is there. You know, having marquee customers that you've got relationships with brings you money. Yeah. Now, if you want to get a marquee customer, you got to offer some kind of value that they don't have, right? Right. Right. I had a customer, I'll give you an example. I'm going to use names, but uh, I had a client that, that, that was in a very competitive commodity business. There was actually a lot of technical research went into the product. And he, his strength was technical. I mean, his, his strength, he was good at it. Yep. And, and, and I asked him when we went through the client process, I said, you're doing all this technical work, but you're still competing on price with your with your competitors. And the, the competitor in this industry was a big company from Europe that was buying up all the independents. So they were forcing price down on all the, sure. the independents. So I said, uh, you know, you're incurring the cost. You've got a great reputation, but you don't get paid for it. So what we decided was he wasn't going to be the manufacturer anymore. He was going to be an R&D company that could manufacture. And what that allowed him to do, instead of selling to purchasing over time, it took about two years, was to sell the engineering. The engineering had a problem. They'd come to him and they'd say, yeah, I can do that. And then they'd spec his product back through manufacturing. And that worked out really great for him. He he got some major deals with, with oil companies, major oil company, that he wouldn't have gotten the other way. Mm-hmm. They went with a big name. He's not a big company. Yeah. So it's just a way of thinking that says, what can I do that's different in my industry? What am I good at? And how can I exploit that? In his case, it worked perfectly. He was willing to take that risk. So, uh, you know, my hat's off to him. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, and, and listen, we're in a day and age where more and more businesses are becoming commoditized, right? It's easier for a business to be commoditized. So, so having that 
you know, differentiator, um, you know, is, is, has become, you know, even more important. Um, you know, it's just, it's just the way markets are becoming more efficient with the internet and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of reasons that, that have uh, margin, you know, margin compression in, in various industries. And it's, it's true, you know, in, uh, you know, everything from, from manufacturing to professional services and, you know, and, you know, consulting and whatever, I mean, you know, um, so, um, yeah, so so having that you know having that differentiator is you know is is a, is a crucial thing. Um, you know, um, one of the things that you um, sort of alluded to, but it was more of a direct you know deal with the Amex thing back then, is you know I, I think one of the um, underutilized concepts in some areas, right? There, there are there are areas where channel partner type deals are done all the time, right? You know where where you don't deal with the end client, or at least not directly. But you know, you get brought in by a channel partner, and maybe there's some economic split. And I've always been a big believer that that concept can be applied to many, many industries, even if you don't have. I mean, I'll just give an example with me. Uh, I have this one of my niches. We do a lot with tech companies and other companies or whatever. All, we've done deals, you name it, manufacturing, restaurants, art licensing, you know, whatever. But we have this niche in financial services, and we work with a lot of investment advisor firms. We get, I mean, we have enough of a reputation now in referrals and even, even just because the content we put out, we get, we get direct stuff, but we still probably get 80% of our business um, from a handful of referral sources. They're not truly channel partners because as a lawyer, I can't pay them. I can't split fees with them, but we built relationships with the custodians, the Schwabs, the Fidelities, the TDs, with the recruiters in the industry, with the investment bankers in the industry on the M&A side. And, um, and they're usually, especially the, um, especially the, uh, the custodians, because the custodians have sale, salespeople, like business development offices that are calling upon these investment advisors at Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley and UBS and, you know, to get them Goldman Sachs, wherever, to get them to go independent and start their own firm. And they'll call on these folks for years, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, they're much earlier in the process. At some point when they make a decision to leave, they need legal help, right? So, um, you know, so for me, I've effectively have a, you know, indirect unpaid to me, you know, like, un, uh, you know, no cost to me sales force, essentially indirectly working for me because they're working for Schwab or Fidelity or TD, whatever. They get these guys to go, you know, and women to go independent. Um, then they need legal work to get them out of where they are, set up the norm firm, whatever. And they're saying, go use Cupfer, right? Um, and, you know, I know in manufacturing and distribution, those types of deals are, are pretty common, you know, uh, depending upon, and certainly in tech, um, so, you know, uh, any experience with that, with that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think of one that we were talking about. But yeah, I mean, it's always a, a resource. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of founders that I see have relationships from their past life. Yeah. The problem with that is they're aged. You know? Right. So once those people move on, then it becomes, um, becomes uh, obsolete, right? So... Uh, I'm trying to think of how, uh, one I like about myself. I'll give you an example myself. A lot of my referrals come from banks that I knew in the past. You know, I had a bank. I wrote a book a few years ago, a couple of books actually, but uh, one of them I gave to a banker buddy of mine and he read it and he, he bought copies for all his branch managers. Then he had me come in to a one-day seminar for his branch managers. And then he set up 14 of his clients. Once a month, I'd meet with him to go through the book with, with his clients, his business clients. Oh, that's great. That's great. So, you know, that's the kind of, yeah, I can, I see that happening. Um, I'm trying to think of with clients, uh, you know, one in particular, yeah, he's, he's got some uh, uh, civic interest. Yep. And uh, because of the civic interest, he's an in industrial service. I mean, he's, he's locked in to that market with the same thing people that are property managers, maybe that don't have anything to do with, with his realm are still referring him. So yeah, you use that, you know, absolutely. Yep. All right, any, um, before we uh, get to the final two questions, uh, any last thoughts, uh, things you wanna leave the audience with uh, about deals, about, you know, preparing, so yeah, anything, yeah, any last thoughts? Great, it's a great way to grow business. I mean, I, my business made Inc. 500 back in the seventh year. And it's because of the, the strategic partnerships. In Europe, we, we, we uh, partner with HP and handled all the returns for Western Europe. We actually co-located the building of them. Wow. And I took 80 people from HP into my company. 
Uh, so establish me in Europe. And you get established in Europe with HP, you're established. Yes. So, I mean, you, you got to look for opportunities, I think, to do that. And uh, to do that, you got to bring some value to the table. Uh, Love, it. Love it. So listen, um, I'm sure that the audience has gotten major value from this, Martin. I appreciate you coming on. Uh, if people want to find out more about your services and what you do, what's the best place for them to go? MartinHarsberger.com. <laughs> there you go. MartinHarsberger.com. H-A-R-S-H-B-E-R-G-E-R, right? Harshberger. Um, so and the, that'll be in the show notes, uh, folks. So if, you, if you're driving or whatever, don't worry about it. You'll, you can pick it up in the show notes. Definitely check out uh, uh, Martin's work. He does a lot of great work with so many companies and you, you hear his background and experience that he brings to the table. Um, so Martin, my last question on the podcast is uh, freedom is my highest single ideal in life, value in life. Uh, and that means, you know, freedom for all people around the world to live the kind of lives they want to live and not be oppressed to the reason I'm an entrepreneur and I haven't had a boss and except for my clients, of course, you know, I haven't had a boss in 30, 30 years. Um, what is, what does freedom mean to you and, uh, and how does it apply in your life and business? Well, there's, there's several times right now, you know, if you look at what's going on in the country, freedom of speech is, is, a, is a concern, but I, I mean, financial freedom, uh, to me, it's doing what I like to do. I mean, I'm, I'm in my 70s and I've retired twice. <laughs> I, I can't take it. I mean, I, I, I just got, I got to stay busy. And to me, that's freedom because I don't have to do it, but I, I do it. So I do it because I enjoy it. So that's kind of, kind of freedom, I guess. Love it. Martin, thanks so much for being on the podcast. I appreciate it. Thanks.